Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the first afternoon session here on Saturday. First up, we're going to have Dustin Ingram talking about PEP 572, the walrus operator. Please welcome Dustin Ingram. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dustin. I'm a developer advocate at Google. I focus on Python. I also work on the Python package index and some other things. Um, but I want you to just sort of think of me as, for this, the purposes of this talk, as just a regular Python user, just like all of y'all. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is a PEP, PEP572. Um, but before I tell you about this PEP and what it does, uh, we need to talk a little bit about Python governance. So Python governance is the answer to the question, how do we govern the language of Python? How do we make changes to the language? How do we uh, implement new features and that kind of thing? How do we make decisions about Python? Uh, so when Python was first created, uh, its creator installed himself as the BDFL, the Benevolent Dictator for Life. Uh, dictator meaning that he can do whatever he wants to the language. Benevolent meaning that he's generally going to be looking out for us. Uh, so this is creator of Python, Kita Van Rossum. And uh, yeah, he's our BDFL. And the thing to note is, you know, maybe at the beginning of Python, Guido was making a lot of these decisions himself. Guido didn't, until recently, didn't really make all these decisions himself anymore. Um, instead, what we do is we have a process, and that's called the uh, Python Enhancement Proposal Process, the PEP. Uh, so a PEP is kind of like uh, an amendment to the Constitution for a country. Uh, the Constitution determines how a country is going to be governed. Uh, so each PEP determines how, what we're going to do with the language and how we're going to change the language. And each one sort of builds on a previous PEP. So we started with PEP 1, and we went along. So can anyone name a PEP? PEP 8. <laughs> yeah, PEP 8. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. Uh, so PEP 8 is a style guide for Python code. It's a PEP that describes sort of a general way to write Python code. Its author is Guido Van Rossum. So this is a pretty early PEP, and it was authored by Guido himself. Uh, another well-known PEP is PEP 20. This is the Zen of Python. This is what you get if you type import this in your Python REPL. Uh, its author was Tim Peters. Tim was one of the, also the core Python contributors. Uh, my favorite PEP is PEP 566, metadata for Python software packages 2.1. The reason I like this PEP so much is because I am the author of this PEP. <laughs> so when I wrote this PEP, uh, this is kind of what the process was like. First, I wrote a draft of the PEP in sort of this format that all the sort of PEPs fall into. Then the PEP was accepted by somebody, and then it was implemented. So sort of a three-step process. And the important thing to note here is that Guido himself did not approve my PEP directly. Uh, I'm actually quite sure he has never read it, and he has no idea who I am. Uh, instead, and that's OK, uh, instead, <laughs> instead we have what we call BDFL delegates. So these are people that Guido has entrusted to make decisions about the language, either because um, he, they know more about a certain area of the language or about Python than him. He thinks they're uh, you know, better stewards of that area, or he just doesn't know or doesn't care about that. So for example, packaging stuff, he, has, he thinks other people can make that decision better. And so he's entrusted someone else to approve PEPs in that area. So the flow of power is kind of like this. Uh, Guido uh, gives power to the BDFL delegates, and those delegates can then approve or reject PEPs and thus change the language. And sometimes Guido is also still you know, accepting PEPs himself. So you might have heard about PEP 572. This is a relatively recent PEP that was created. Uh, its title was Assignment Expressions. And the reason you might have heard about it is because it caused just a little bit of drama. And we'll talk about that in a second. This PEP is centered around just two characters. Uh, this is a new operator in Python. It has a name. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Instead, I'm going to call this the walrus operator, because it kind of looks like a walrus lying on its side. right? Uh, and an <laughs> important thing to note is I gave this talk once before, and someone was really concerned that this walrus was dead. Um, he's not dead. He is just resting. <laughs> OK. So instead of just reading you the pep, uh, I'm going to give you some short examples to show you how the walrus operator can be used and what you can do with it. Uh, so one thing that you might want to use it for is balancing uh, lines of code and complexity, LOC versus big O uh, complexity. So here's an example where we have a list. And in this list, we have uh, three items, f of x, f of x to the power of 2, f of x to the power of 3. right? And we're assigning it to the value foo. 
Let's say that the function f of x is really expensive to compute here. Let's say it takes like a full minute to run that function. So when we create this list, we're calling f of x three times. Uh, and if it's really expensive, we're gonna, it's going to take three times as long to run. Um, so what, we ca what can we do to like, make this a little bit more efficient? We're going to get the same answer from it uh, regardless of how many times we call it. So let's just call it once and put it in a variable. And then we can reuse that variable in the list. So this is great. Um, but some people might say, I kind of like that first one better because it was on one line. This one's on two lines. And I'm like, creating a variable. With the walrus operator, you don't need to do either of those things. Instead, you can use the walrus operator to uh, assign to the variable y inside the list and then reuse y uh, later on in that list. You can just reuse that variable right there in line in the list. So that's avoiding expensive computations. Another thing you can do is avoid inefficient comprehensions. So here's a little example. Um, and I'll just walk through this real quick. So first, we initialize a list that's empty, results. Then we iterate over something uh, called a variable data. And for everything in data, we call a function, and we get a result from it. And if that result is truthy, we append the result to our results. And if it's not, we don't do anything with it. So this is for just a pretty straightforward little loop. And generally, when I look at something like this, where we have that initialization of an empty list sitting outside of a for loop like that, that's kind of a code smell, right? Generally, if you see that in Python, you know that, hmm, I could probably turn that into a list comprehension. And if you did, you would be right. You could turn that into a list comprehension pretty easily. And it would look a lot nicer and be a few shorter lines of code. However, it would also be more inefficient. So the problem here is that we're calling f of x again. And if f of x is, again, really expensive to compute, we're doing it twice here instead of before when we were only doing it once. With the walrus operator, we can do the same thing. So in the uh, sub-expression of this comprehension, in the filter clause, so that if statement, we can assign y to the value of f of x. And then we can reuse it in the comprehension later. Another thing we can do, we can avoid unnecessary variables in scope. So here's an example. This is kind of familiar if you do anything with uh, regular expressions. Maybe we um, search over some pattern, uh, or search over some set of data for a pattern, and we get this like match object back. And then we need to test if the match object is, is truthy or not and determine if we have a match or not. So uh, this might look a little weird to you because you know, we're creating this match object, but we're only using it inside that if statement. And that's not going to be used later, and, and we just need to know if it exists or not, and then we can do things with it if it does. Um, with the walrus expression, walrus operator, we can just, in that if conditional, uh, assign match right there. And then it doesn't exist outside the scope of that if statement. It's just like a little bit of a tighter uh, piece of syntax, and it's just right there in, in two lines. And match isn't hanging around later. Another example, processing streams in chunks. This is a pretty common pattern. So if we have like a really big file, and we want to read it in little pieces at a time. Uh, one common way to do this is we'll take a chunk, and then we'll iterate. We'll process that chunk, and then we'll take a new chunk, and we'll reassign to a chunk variable over and over and over again until the file is empty, so while chunk. Um, so this, is, this, is, this works. This is fine. But one thing that's kind of like not pretty here is that that chunk equals file.read and some magic number is being repeated twice here. So like if I decide I want to change the size of the chunk, I have to change it on two lines, not just one. And like maybe I could put that in a variable, and that could live outside. But uh, we can make it even simpler with the walrus operator. So here, again, we can just use chunk just like that if statement before, put it inside the um, while expression, and then we just process it until it's falsy, and then the while loop exits. OK, some short examples. You might say, why? Why do we need to do this? All those examples before worked totally fine, and uh, you know, let's not change anything. Like, OK. So one thing to note is that generally, fewer lines are better. Um, programmers kind of hate change. And so if you can minimize your diffs by just at least like one line, it's usually worth it, right? It's, it's less noise in your pull requests and things like that. So here in this example, if I can take these two lines, I can turn them into just one line. Like My coworkers are going to totally love me. And it's a 50% reduction in code, so it's just less lines to review. Also, fewer lines could be more efficient, too. So some of the people that were sort of evaluating this PEF, they went and found some examples. And they found an example like this, where we're doing the regular expression thing, and we're, we're checking to see if the match is in a group. And instead of writing this, the programmer wrote this. They decided, oh, I'm just going to throw this all on one line, and uh, you know, then th it's just a little simpler to read. One line, fine. Um, but what they're doing here is they're calling read.match twice. And again, that's more inefficient, right? You're calling the exact same thing over again. 
this line is going to be twice as slow as, than it was, as it was before. With a Wallace operator, they could have written this. It's exactly the same length. It's still one line, but you're only calling match once. So ultimately, this is kind of a trade-off between developer and computer efficiency. OK. You might be looking at all this, and you might say, yeah, this kind of actually looks like something I know. This kind of looks like the equals operator. Uh, and it even kind of looks like the equals operator, too. right? It's got the equals sign in it. One thing it's important to note that this is actually nothing like the equals operator. And everywhere that you can use the equals operator, you cannot use the walrus operator. So one example is multiple targets. With the equals operator, you can say x equals y equals z equals 0. x, y, and z all become 0. You can't do that with the walrus operator. Another example is uh, assigning to things other than a variable name. So uh, we can do at a of i the index and set that to a variable. You can't do that with the walrus operator. Uh, another one is uh, assignments to things other than a name. So we can set self.rest to an empty list. You can't do that with the Walrus operator. And again, uh, here's another one, comma priority. So x, 1, comma 2, that creates a tuple, 1, 2. With the Walrus operator, that doesn't. It sets x equal to 1. The priority is to, with a comma and it's closer to the operator. Another one is the augmented assignment operator, so the plus equals. So we can do you know, total plus equals tax with the uh, uh, regular operator. We can't do that with the Wallace operator. And actually, like, I don't even know what we would call that <laughs> at that point. It's kind of like a Wallace with a, a Pope hat on top. <laughs> OK, so that's PEP 572. Let's talk about the reception of how this PEP was received when it was first drafted. So like I said before, most people kind of hate change. Programmers especially hate it when things change. So one of the first, like most obvious receptions to this was backwards incompatibility. So this is changing. Uh, where is this going to work? Like if we add this to Python, it's not going to work on older versions of Python. It's not backwards compatible at all. Uh, another concern was teachability. Like what do we call this? So I've avoided actually using the real name for this operator. I've been calling the Walrus operator, but we can't call it the Walrus operator. That's that's jargon. We need a real name for it that, that tells us what it does. So we can't call it the assignment operator. We could call it the becomes operator. We could call it the named expression operator. And so that last one is actually the name for it, the named expression operator. But it's still, it's hard. Like if I tell you, oh, we're adding a named expression operator to Python, you might not understand what that means. Another is just attractiveness. A lot of people looked at this and they said, wow, that is, that's just ugly. I hate it. It's really weird and different. Uh, and so there was a lot of discussion about this. There was long mailing list threads debating the merits of this PEP, like really long mailing list threads. Uh, there were polls where core contributors were polled to see uh, if they liked it or not. And the results were actually, you know, a lot of, a lot of people disliked it. Some people liked it. Some people had no opinions. Um, some of the core contributors weighed in with uh, opinions of their own. So Tim Peters said that the current proposal would have a modest but clear improvement in quite a few bits of code. Uh, Barry Warsaw said that since it changes the syntax of the language, people are tending to focus on that without understanding the kind of deeper issues here. Uh, Ukash Langa said dictators should dictate. He thought that Guido <laughs> should just do whatever he wanted and ignore what everyone is talking about. And in fact, Guido himself said that he had to stop reading the threads so he wouldn't go insane. Uh, so after a long period of discussion, Guido accepted this PEP. He marked it as accepted, went from draft to accepted. He merged the pull request. And then he sent this email to the Python committers mailing list, stepping down as BDFL. He said that now PEP 572 is done, I don't ever want to have to fight so hard for a PEP and find that people despise my decisions. And so he's going to remove himself entirely from the decision process. So uh, in my talks, I like to post Twitter reactions that people have. So, th so here's some of the things that people said afterwards. Um, this person is pretty funny. A long time before this happened, he said, Dear Python, all I want for my birthday is the chunk example that I showed before. And then after this happened, he said, I just realized that thanks to PEP 572, I'm getting my birthday present, but at what cost? Our BDFL has stepped down. Pinnock said, PEP 572 ro what rocks. What a farewell gift. Uh, this person said, TFW Reddit says, PEP 572 lost the Zen of Python. But the author of the Zen of Python is a co-author of the PEP. Um, this person said Guido is stepping down as BDFL of Python. Uh, and th he claimed, quoted the first line of that uh, uh, message. And he said, I'm shocked by the vitriol we throw at the people 
who run our most important free and open source software projects. And as an example of that, there was also this tweet. PEP 572 is a trash feature, and I'm sad that it was the straw that broke Guido's back. So I want to be really explicit and clear here. If we're talking about straws that are breaking people's backs, the straw that broke Guido's back was not trash peps that were heaped upon him by pep authors. The straw that broke Guido's back was when people were calling your work trash, by like anonymous and strange people on the internet. I think when we're on the internet, we kind of tend to forget who we're talking to. Like, dictators are people too, right? <laughs> and it's true. Guido is a person. He has thoughts and feelings just like all of us. And just because he's like a super famous creator of our language doesn't mean that we have to get to treat him that way. And actually, it's not just true for Guido. This is true for like all people that maintain and work on open source software in our community. Maintainers are people too. Really, just like think about it like this. People are people too, right? Okay, I'm gonna preempt some questions about this. So one question. What does this mean for Python? Okay? It actually had a pretty big effect on Python. I had someone ask the question, is this gonna be the pep to end all peps? And that was kind of true, actually. So like I said before, uh, the power to approve and change language derives power from Guido. So when Guido stepped down, with no Guido, we had no BDFL delegates that got their power from him, and thus we could uh, not approve any peps, and we couldn't make any change to the language. So we're like a little bit stuck. That said, it's going to be OK. So really immediately after this happened, um, some smart people got to work on this new governance problem. And they created another PEP, uh, the Python Language Governance Proposal Overview. And this sort of outlined exactly what we were going to do to create a new governance model for Python. Uh, they also created PEP 8001, uh, which outlined the voting process for how we're going to um, uh, decide who gets to vote and decide what we're going to do, and uh, had made an explicit list of who could vote on that. Uh, and also, they did a survey of all of the other open source uh, projects and ecosystems that have similar governance um, models and see if we could emulate them or learn from them in some way. There were a whole bunch of proposals. There was a voting period where we selected one of them. The one that was selected was announced uh, in December of last year, and that was PEP 8016, the Steering Council model. Uh, and this was proposed by Nathaniel Smith and Donald Stuffed. Then we voted on who would be on that steering council, and I'm not going to tell you what happened, because tomorrow morning, uh, the keynote is actually the steering council. Everyone that was elected to the steering council is going to be up on the stage doing a panel discussion, uh, moderated by Eva. And actually, even right after that, if you really want to geek out about the um, governance problem, Shauna Gordon McKeon is going to give a talk uh, right afterwards uh, in the first, first track about the new era of governance. So I'll leave that to her. It's going to be a great talk. All right, let's get back to the, the walrus operator. So some more Q&A. Will this become part of Python? The answer to this is actually it already has. So most of you probably aren't using Python 3.8, but you could be using it right now. It's in alpha. Uh, Emily Morehouse is a core developer. And she's already implemented this in 3.8. So it exists. You can go and play with it today if you install Python 3.8. You might say, ah, well, I don't like it. That's totally fine. You don't have to like it. If you don't like it, then don't write it. It's that simple. No one is going to force you to use the walrus operator. Uh, and if someone on your team is telling you that you should be using it, then just convince them that you don't have to use it or that they shouldn't use it. You know, that's a discussion that you need to have with your team. Another question you might have, is Guido coming back? So this kind of depends on what you mean, right? So like, is Guido coming back to Python? Well, yeah, he's, he's here. Like, he's here. He's going to be there for us. He's not actually on a vacation on a beach somewhere. Uh, is Guido, or so the answer to that is yes. Is Guido going to come back as BDFL? And the answer to that is definitely no. We have solved the governance process. We've found a new model. We've elected new people to that committee. And so there will no longer be a BDFL for Python. Another question you might have, will this ever happen again? And that, again, kind of depends on what you mean. So maybe your question is, will another PEP ever be this controversial? I'm going to say probably not. Um, this PEP was an outlier. It was a very small syntax change that was easily understandable by people that looked at it. They could look at it and make a decision really quickly, kind of a gut reaction to it. Uh, I think that this was just a, the unique, it was a unique PEP that was particularly controversial. However, maybe your question is, will people continue to be negative on the internet? And my answer to that is like, I don't know. I hope not. Uh, I'd really like it if we all could learn from this 
and sort of just treat each other a little bit better and be more open and receptive to new ideas. Uh, but so many people use Python now, and for most of those people, the language already kind of feels perfect. And they don't want it to change. So maybe this is the new status quo. Maybe we're going to get really upset about every time the language changes. Um, but I think we can work past that. So uh, come and find me after the talk. And if you promise that you're going to be nice on the internet, I will happily give you one of these Walrus Operator stickers that, that Emily created. Uh, I'll be happy to give one to you. Thanks, everybody. Do we have time for questions? Okay, I'll take some questions. Again, please be please be sure to phrase your question as a question. <laughs> uh, I mean, I didn't know anything about this, but uh, it sounds like it's actually a good thing because. You know, Guido's not going to be around forever, and having a, a council like this means Python will live on beyond Guido's lifetime. Yeah, I think we were probably all uh, hoping that Guido would live forever, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I said, he's a person too. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we had to solve this problem eventually anyway. Unfortunately, it was a bit dramatic. Uh, would have nice to have Guido like, actually just choose to retire rather than reactionary to some event, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good thing that we uh, solved this problem because we we're going we're gonna to do it at some point anyway. Right. Thank you for the talk and the thing about there about having it being my birthday present, but not what I ex not I didn't expect the cost. That sort of sums up my feeling as well. Yeah. Uh, my question is: other languages have something like this, and Python is a continually developing language. Do you see more changes like this, where Python is pulling things in from other languages, or do you see Python as being more static and a leader in terms of what a language should be, and therefore not changing to adopt these? Uh, that's a great question. So I, I'll preface that with, I'm not a core developer, so I'm not actually making any of these right, decisions. Right, it, it's a value judgment anyway. Sure. Uh, actually, it was funny, when I was originally talking to this uh, to someone about this pep, they were like, oh, we should just make Python a standard. Like, literally just freeze the language, make it an ANSI standard, and it just will never change. And I'm like, that, that's great, but like Python needs to be able to evolve to uh, keep up with other programming languages, but also just to you know add new features and syntax when we uh, find new uses for the language. So, mm -hmm. like I said, Python is being used everywhere for lots of things. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 totally likely that we might you know again need to add uh, pull in things from other languages, make modifications and improvements to the language. It's it's still evolving. Thanks Thank for the you. question. Any other questions? We've still got a few minutes. If anybody else has a question. Okay. okay, thanks everybody. I'll be in the hallway afterwards. <laughs>